So I see that you have your glass of wine there and it's fine because we're going to get to a fun part of, of this interview now. I have a coffee and you have your Excellent. wine. So it's, I mean, it's, I, also, I also have a big glass of water too. So. That's okay. And I have a bottle of water so we can, yeah. Okay. Now that we, we've let everyone see what we're up to. Okay, I'd really like to talk about your TED Talk because when I was looking into your background and doing a little bit of stalking on Wendy LeBorn, <laughs> I, I came across your TED Talk and I went ahead and, and, and watched it and I loved it. And what you had to say was really interesting and like it just you know i i just thought it was it was fantastic so the topic of the ted talk was vocal branding beyond words how your voice shapes your communication image so i would love to know and i'm sure our listeners would how did this come about how did you become a ted talker <laughs> um it was a bucket list item no i uh for me it's uh, that yeah truly it was and it was something that as i embark on this next phase of my career where i take voice to the next level or what i hope to take to the next level and then give back to people um is empowering their voice um so that they can be heard and so taking the art and the science of voice is what I wanted to talk about. And so voice brand, you know, it, what people, people talk about personal branding and all that. Mm -hmm. And what I think people, for me, which seems so uh, basic, I guess I'll say, yes, your, yes. Vo your voice is the single most important aspect of communication from my perspective. You can put on all the makeup in the world, you can do your hair, you can have the best clothes, but if you open your mouth to speak and you can have the best speech written, but if you open your mouth to speak and it is not congruent with everything else, mm -hmm. people will see through you in a moment. So finding and empowering that authentic voice and from a science standpoint, what do we know? What draws us to some voices? What makes us turn off some voices? And so I decided I'm going to apply to do a TED talk and I applied and I was accepted. And um, those might've been the most 12 terrifying minutes of my life. I was going um, it to was say, were you terrified? So, you know, I've performed all over the world and, and I am not, I'm, I love getting up and talking in front of people. I love presenting and singing and all of those things. Um, I will say the TED stage is a little lonely. It's you in a spotlight and you have no, no, you know, I'm very used to but talking with the research. With it was, there oh, yeah, there were, yeah, there was, it was probably, I don't know, maybe five or 600 people in the audience oh, okay. um, at the time. Um, okay. And then there's, there's cameras, right? Cause they're filming this. Mm. Um, and there's a big, big clock, which counts down like 12, 11, you like no. you have your time. And no. so there's that staring at you and you don't have any notes. Um, so the challenge for me, uh, when I, and I've worked with Ted speakers since then, like coaching them on their presentations and their voice, How cool. you know, I think it is, it is, it's been a joy um, that you need to sound like it's the first time you've spoken those words, right? It needs to sound conversational, but it's completely, completely rehearsed because you know, you have to get from point A to point B in 12 minutes, that whole arc. Um, so uh, that was challenging, but for me, I knew what those five elements of voice brand were, and that's what I wanted to talk about. So yeah, it's, it's been pretty amazing. I, I, I haven't, I don't go back and watch it. Um, but I know that it's had <laughs> yeah. some good traction. Yeah. Um, so how is the voice the single most unique thing about us? What is it about the voice? Um, in rather than say facial expressions or body language or the words themselves, why is it the voice? Do you feel? 
Um, well, we see this also across species. It's not just, ah. um, it's not, it's not unique to humans, right? Any of us, you, I, and I even go back to a mother and babies cry. You can hear five babies cry. If you're a mom, none of those babies cries bother you except your own. And you can, oh, you identify oh, with so a cry, true. right? So yes. that initial sound of voice, you know, if an animal is in pain, Yes. By hearing it cry. Yes. Um, you know, when, I, I mean, sometimes you can tell when animals are mating by the sound, right? So um, it is voice that we hear. It is mm-hmm. it's sound that we hear, right? Yes. And so as humans, um, the, they're also, um, the, the neurobiology of voice, the hardwiring from the brain, the emotional center of the brain to the voice, the, the laryngeal muscles impact tightness. So if all of us, most of us at least have had the experience where you get angry or you get upset and you are trying really hard, like you, you have to say something hard or you're having a fight with your spouse, whatever it might be. Yes. And that you get that burning knot in your throat and there is you, your voice people can tell you're going to cry before you ever cry, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though you're trying your darndest not to, because it's hardwired. So there's this emotional connection. So this is this immediate empathy. And um, we have these mirror neurons in our brain where they like to mirror what we see, what we hear. So if I smile, Oftentimes you'll smile right back, right? So it's these I just neurons that happen. I know you did. <laughs> well, right? I didn't mean to. <laughs> um, so when when we hear um if we hear a happy voice, if we hear a sad voice, even if we don't sound that way back, we actually empathize with yes, what we're hearing. Yes. Um and we hear this in music too, right? Like Mm. loud, loud makes us feel one way. Soft makes us feel high pitches, low pitches, fast rhythms, slow rhythms. So for me, as a musician, as, as, a, as somebody, um, who, who has spent my whole life immersed in music, it is the musicality. We know what's be- to our ears, what's beautiful. Um, oh, I just lost you. Sorry. Hello. We are back. There we go. Sorry. So we know we know what's beautiful and what's not and what we're doing. Um, and we all have our own aesthetics, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And if we, you and I were talking about this. Yes. Did kind of our pre-interview. It's like, yes, you know, I love an Australian accent. I think it's, you know, I wish I had that. And and there are there are vocal turn ons of what we we are we tune into and things that are really detractors. And so when you develop your voice brand, when you think about your voice brand, those things play into it. Um, also, I think what's uniquely human is that all of the experience of our lives fold into our vocal story, how mm-hmm. tall we are, how short we are, um, the wow. space that your tongue, I mean, the wow. space that your tongue takes, I mean, all of those things create your authentic vocal story. Um, wow. wh- and even though I always ask uh, clients that I'm working with, who do they like listening to? Who are their kind of vocal role models from speaking or singing standpoint? Um, I don't like people to imitate voices uh, because that is not uniquely authentic to them. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's about you being the best voice you can be. And we can all be better at what we do because this is a system like anything else. Yes. It also takes practice to get to that point. Um, I think great speakers don't, they're not just born great speakers. They, we learn more by our failures than our successes oftentimes. Absolutely. Um, yes. And it, it's hard to get up and speak and, and use your mm-hmm. voice. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I'm hearing you, girlfriend. <laughs> all of those things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there were five key elements that you spoke about in your TED Talk. Mm-hmm. And they were really in- interesting Would you be able to break those down for us and give us examples of how they influence or don't influence or the perceptions around some of those things? Sure. So they are quality. And so I'll I'll do those 
individually because it's just probably easier. Yes. So quality, quality is what I like to think of as the hoarseness or the clarity of the voice that actually comes from the vocal fold level. So, you know, we talked about a pathologic voice versus a healthy voice or, a no, you know, a normal voice, we're drawn to interesting. We, we talked about this yes. a little earlier too, yes. right? Yes. So, so many very famous voices have just a little bit of hoarseness or a little bit of an edge to them mm -hmm. or something that's unique about them. Think about the voices you love to listen to, right? Yes. Yes. Male or female. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's the inherent quality. Um, and sometimes that can't be changed um, from, you know, I don't necessarily want to take a clear voice and make it hoarse. <laughs> Let's just say that. No. Similar, similarly, I don't always want to take a hoarse voice and make it clear because sometimes it gets people jobs because they have an interesting quality. Um, from an, a physiologic standpoint, hoarseness especially in um, women and men and not just one, but think about it for a minute, Marissa. How do people get hoarse voices usually? Are they overused? You know, are you, a, are, are, you a, or, are you a good girl or are you a bad girl? If you oh, hoarse voice? oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Sometimes good girls can, they can talk like this too and do a bit. <laughs> but that's, but that's a pitch. That's pitch, right? Like that's yes, not that is pitch. If you're no. talking horse. Yeah. So we sometimes think like smoking, drinking, partying. Oh, they're right. fun people, right? right? Like, right. And it's an unconscious thing sometimes. Um, so they're you know, the people that make the phone calls. They are sometimes they are, <laughs> um, you know, we know biologically that women, when they are, um, when they're ovulating, they oftentimes have a change in voice quality mm -hmm. and men don't necessarily recognize that, but as species, like they do, like it, it had to do with how procreation, you know, like how it happened because, um, you get a little edema on your vocal folds. You sound a little huskier when that happens, it's, wow. it's literally happening at the level of your vocal cords. So anyway, that's a little bit of the quality. Sure. Intense, intensity of voice, loud and soft, right? Mm -hmm. So intensity is something we can measure in decibels. Loudness is the perceptual correlate of intensity. So, yes. um, and that's based a lot on our biases, right? So I come from a large Italian family and yeah. we talk loud over people all the time. Mm -hmm. When I moved to the middle of the country, people are quieter. And so I, that loudness gets seen oftentimes as aggressive, right? Because yes. of biases. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or people think that you're really outgoing and out there. That's what I get. Cause I come from the Italian family background too. And yeah, people think, wow, she's really full on. Yes. It's, yeah. Absolutely. And then you go the opposite direction. And if people talk really softly like this all the time, then we get the impression that they don't know what they're talking about. They're not confident, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they might just be quiet people. Sure. Um, but that's the perception. So these things all together, and I parse them out into five components but it's really the interplay between the five that we get the, that voice brand. So it's, it's quality partnered with intensity partnered with let's take rate of speech next. That's how fast or how slow you talk. Um, and people are often told, well, slow down. You're talking too fast. But if all of a sudden I slow down my rate of speech with you, it starts to feel condescending, right? <laughs> that yeah. I am talking down to you. Yes, it does. And it also sounds like it's very boring to listen to as well. You think this person lacks energy or it generally? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, we can absolutely get that. And when we combine that with lack of frequency variability, mm -hmm. I need you to get this done today. Like that's very 
uh, slow. It's also pretty monotone. There's not yeah. a lot of frequency, yeah. which and we'll jump to in a second. Yes. Yeah. And you know what my response would be if someone asked me to do that in, in <laughs> that way? I would say, you have no hope. <laughs> um and conversely if somebody talks really fast all the time like this it makes them sound like again they're not they're almost overexcited um it's the intensity yeah. is really a it can be aggressive so if you partner the fast speech with loud i need you to get this done today like it's like oh my god like okay whoa step back, right? Like the house is on fire. Um, those are the, yeah, those are the exact same words, mm -hmm. but one's fast and one's slow. So when we think about, again, voice brand, if I talk slowly, but I yeah. pitch it up here, I need you to get this done today. Like that's a very different feel than changing it all up. So it's, it's that variability, um, for rate, it's the fast and the slow combined. Yes. That makes an interesting speaker. Right? right it is yes yes i need you to get this done today so it's slow mm. and then fast right that is so, so cool so, so we cool. we combine yeah. these things yeah. but it's just like music it's just like music right if i go with the rhythm that's not exciting if i'm doing this it makes it feel a little bit more energized but what's exciting to our ears yeah is this It's that variability in rate and sure, rhythm that sure. we that's interesting absolutely um the fourth thing is frequency which is the overall overarching pitch of your voice mm -hmm. I, I separate this out from intonation because i think of intonation as the melodic line that's the fifth element but pitch is generally high or generally low so if i'm talking to you up here like this depending on where you are in the world and in the country, that's going to feel very different than if I talk to you down here like this. And, you know, it's simply changing laryngeal height. It's changing my pitch. But your perception of me yes, changes. Yes, absolutely. And <laughs> can I just butt in for, for a second? Because one yeah. thing that you shared on the TED Talk was the fact that after the 1960s, women's overall pitch um, lowered um, as the women's rights movement started to amp up and women yeah. started to fight for their rights and they they and with that, with that they didn't want to feel as vulnerable and so the pitch lowered for women I think it was partly that and also for the first time and again I'm not a uh, sociology yeah. <laughs> professor of any stroke. but when you look at this and when you look at what's happening in the culture um you, for the first time women were coming to the table and sitting with men we know that men who have lower pitched voices oh. make make well here's the thing they make more money they father more children they hold positions of higher leadership I, women I ask yeah Sorry. I need to ask one question if they father more children with the low the lower the pitch I want to know how many children Barry White has <laughs> I don't know I don't know right <laughs> it would must be a lot <laughs> it must be. It sorry must be. yeah but you know they evolutionary wise they they, they made it more frequently mm -hmm. um so women came to the table and were like they consciously or unconsciously recognize this but if you're talking up here like this it wasn't being perceived as being taken seriously and so unconsciously it probably drifted um in general at least in the united states in the southern part mm -hmm. southern part of the country mm -hmm. women's voices are still like well bless your heart like it sits oh, up here just yes. a little bit higher yes than the northern yes um, folks yes you're so right which is and fascinating that is so fascinating and yeah that that speaks for itself there but if if i think to the people that inspire me in terms of women that i listen to um you can't go past oprah and and also brene brown their mm -hmm. their their pitch is is quite low right absolutely um Abs yes, absolutely. But what I will tell you mm -hmm. is that they also have what I would consider vocal variability. Mm 
Yes. Right. So that goes to intonation. So yes. de depending on what you want, if, mm -hmm. if, if it is, if it is huge emphasis, we might drop the pitch. Yes. I need you to get this done today. Right. So then I hop back up. So I temper that yes. with a higher pitch. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, but you know that I'm serious because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it could go the opposite. I need you to get this done today. Like we oh. should drop it. And it, it has oh. a very different feeling. That's right? scary. <laughs> and so, I, you know, if we just talk pitch, so these are women that, you know, you talked about two women, Brene Brown and Oprah, who have this amazing command of their voices. They do. Um, they do. And whether it's conscious or unconscious, I would, uh, you know, obviously Brene Brown's work is all around vulnerability. And, and, mm -hmm. and so we see that. I see that when I listen to her, when I listen to her work, um, I do not know her personally. I'll hope no. to someday, but, um, but, but what we hear when she talks about vulnerability, we hear vulnerability in her voice. We do, right. The, we hear uh, authenticity in what she's saying. I don't ever feel when I've listened to her on her podcast or her books, I don't ever feel that the voice is affected. Same thing with Oprah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but Oprah also has, some acting training and you know she we see her you know you watch her in like the color purple we we see this voice she she is um i would suspect has some different voice training than maybe somebody like Brene Brown i don't know but i would suspect mm. yeah. um i i but i do think going back to the vocal authenticity mm -hmm we just can't copy somebody else and you can't go, okay, I want to emphasize that word. Like it sounds completely ridiculous, right? Like you've got to find what that authentic voice to you is. Yes. Um, and I believe you, you know, your voice is because it is so tied to emotion, mm -hmm. hugely, hugely vulnerable. And I'll say, not that men don't have vulnerability. It's, it's different. And certainly in this year of COVID, we've seen empathy all over the place. Yes. We um, in what we do. Um, but when, when women get excited about a topic at work, uh, their kids, whatever it might be, um, their voice often gives them away because how do you become passionate how do you become passionate about something and not start to get a little sometimes quiver or women can't always maintain that stability some that we hear it with men too um but women tend to be seen as um more vocally vulnerable sometimes and how do you temp you know one of the things that i work on with my clients i have yes. a lot of women executives and women clients that want to empower their voices. Yes. How do you convey passion without being overly emotional? And how? Because you, you know, a true to self, number one, you got to know why and how and what you're saying. B, you need to practice it, but not to the point that it is void of emotion. Mm. Um, Yes. But there are, there are things that we can control. We can control breath. We can control heart rate to a certain degree. So we know those things are going to amp up or whatever, when we're put in high pressure situations. Um, so anyway, but that's slightly off topic of what we were talking about, oh, but no, it is the, interesting. it's, it's the authenticity that yes. we have to find that I, that I work to find with individuals and clients, um, whether they're singers or speakers or, CEOs or, you know, pastors, pastors are huge. Your goal is to connect with your congregation, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just the words, but where do you inflect? What words are most important? Um, how do you modify that? Yes, it is a fine line. Like, to be perfectly honest, when it comes to this podcast, for example, and I do my solo round episodes, like I listen back because I like to do my first initial edit myself before it goes on to uh, my assistant. And 
I die sometimes. I listen to my voice and I think, do I really sound like this? I mean, we all don't like our own voices. And then we do have those biases because the people that I listen to are generally Americans. A lot of the, the Americans are the ones that the, the amazing thought leaders that are out there that I love listening to. And I think, wow, you know, I just want to sound like those. I, I sound silly with an Australian accent. And yet you shared with me that you love the American and the, you, the British accent because we sound more intelligent. And yet as an Australian, I feel sometimes I sound ridiculous. So it makes it really hard to find that authentic self when you are judging yourself to put a product out there. So how do we how do I measure that? What would be your advice to me? If you're listening to my voice, what would you advise me to, to do? So first of all, we're always our own worst critics. Yes. Right? Yes. Absolutely. So one of the exercises that I take my clients through is some voice vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. How many of us also like to stand naked in front of the mirror? We are really good no. at pointing out all of the flaws, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. So listening back to yourself is like standing naked in front of the mirror, but from a voice perspective. And so you cue into all of those things mm -hmm. that, you, that you hate about your voice. We are so self-critical. Um, instead... What I like to do is help people get a 360 degree view of their voice. So I say to you, play your voice for five people that don't know you. And I want them to rate your voice. And then wow. you rate your voice on that same segment, right? Yes. So when we, when I work with clients, that's what we do, right? I have external people. Um, and the things that my clients hear are generally not at all, you know, you can, we have, you know, ratings, is this person intelligent or dumb, right? They just have a slider scale and you, and you would rate your voice. No, I'm just making this up, but you might yeah. say, you might slide towards like, I don't feel like I sound intelligent and everybody else is like at 75 and you're at 25. And so why are you perceiving yourself that way when nobody else does? Yes. Um, so those types of things, because um, I think it's important to be self-aware, but not self, not overly self-critical, because um, there are some inherent things that we can't change. But some of those things that people that are unique to you mm -hmm. are, are the things that you should enhance. Yes. Right. Because yes. that's what continues to make you unique. Yes. We can't we can't control other people's biases. Right. Like mine's an American bias. Yours is an Australian bias. Yes. Uh, you know, so um, that's where I go. OK, wh what do you like about your voice? What have people told you from a positive standpoint about your voice? That I have a lot of energy when I speak. Mm hmm. I sound passionate when I speak. Okay. Um, that I speak well. All right. <laughs> Whatever so that if we take, Right. So if I were to analyze that, mm -hmm. you know, that you're energetic when you speak, you have a moderate to fast rate of speech. You can slow down if you need to. And if I slowed that conversation down, mm -hmm we can do that. You, you mirror me, yes. right? So, yes. um, so, but the energy comes from rate of speech, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the emotional connection, I think if just cause I know you a little bit and know some of your musical background, you've got great intonation patterns, right? Oh, so you. people, people connect with that emotionally. Cause when you get excited, your voice goes up a little bit. And if you yes. want to talk about serious, it goes down. So um, that's inherent to you probably because of your musicality um, in to some culture degree. too, would you say? Like say that one more time. The Italian culture as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the third thing, you, oh, that you, you didn't say articulate, but I will say that you are 
we don't hear, um, there's not mumbling in what you say. Uh, there's not a lot of ifs, ands, buts, ums, uh-huh. So people perceive that as being coherent, easy to understand mm -hmm. versus all of a sudden if somebody's starting on here like this and you really can't really understand what they're saying. Is that mm. <laughs> right? And yes. so we don't hear that in you. Yes. So if so if those are the three things that work really well for you, let's work on enhancing those to the next level, right? I, As opposed to going, I hate the pitch of my voice, or I listen to myself and I sound uber nasal, whatever it is that you mm -hmm. are critical of. So if I were to say to you, what are you most critical of in your voice? When you listen to it, what do you not like about your own voice? Well, sometimes the, the, I'm trying to find the word, maybe the pitch. Sometimes I don't like the pitch. Do you think it's too high or too low? Well, sometimes I think it's too high and then sometimes I think it's too low <laughs> and it's trying to find that place where you think, okay, sitting there, I don't sound unintelligent and then sitting down here, I don't sound too authoritarian or boring either. It's trying to find that place and it's when I don't worry about it it's when it's fine mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the other thing is when I say words I have I've found since recording myself a lot is if I have words that have a lot of L's or a lot of N's I found that I get I find I get stuck on those words so I think there must be like a little bit of something going on somewhere that whether it's the tongue or the something's going on where I, I'm getting stuck. And you, so those, the L's and the N's are something that you can absolutely work on. You know, hmm. we if, if we work together, I would load sentences with N's, N's and L's. No one knew Norman's nickname. Like we went, you know, again, we no were practicing. Yeah. See, I'm stuck already. <laughs> Yeah. But that's something from an articulatory standpoint that we go, okay, yeah. this is now going to the vocal branding gym, right? We say, okay, these are the things you do really well. Let's maximize those with some exercises. These are the things where you struggle. Let's work on decreasing the detractors. I don't think that we ever eliminate our detractors, but you know, spanks were made for a reason it's to decrease the detractors <laughs> right <laughs> so, <laughs> i need a spank on my voice <laughs> right now vocal spanks right i need no, but uh, <laughs> that would be but I, there there are things that we can do to minimize mm -hmm. our detractors uh in what we do yeah uh, so um but we won't eliminate them and that's again, that is part of our vocal story, right? That's yes. part of who yes. we are yeah. and that is okay. Um, and the other so, thing is yeah. too, how far can we go by trying to change and without controlling, losing our authenticity and also where we could run into voice pathologies because we get so caught up and uptight about all these things. And that's what I really, really, really try to shy away from because mm. we, when is you, you said this already, you've already answered your own question. When your voice is the best is when you're not thinking about it. Yes. Right. Yes. And so when I work with any speaker, um, it is about your voice is your best. When you're talking to your best friend, when yes. you're having a conversation about Oh my gosh, did you hear what happened today? You are engaged. You're passionate about the topic. It is authentic to you. Yes. The challenge comes when the stakes are high, right? You need to get venture capital from somebody. You need something from someone else. Mm -hmm. And so your voice becomes the medium for you to do that. And so it becomes inauthentic because we have all of these other layers. So not that you can talk to your venture capital firms like you talk to your best friend, but you no. want to have some, but you want to have some of that in there. Yes. Because absolutely. We want, we want to do business with people. We, we don't do. want to do, we do, right? So yes, you've got to be approachable. Yes. Yes. And so that's really important. Yes. So when people get all tied up in their voice, it is terrible. 
So mm -hmm. it is about the conversation. Um, there is no perfect voice. There is no right voice. Yes. Um, it, it is not one size fits all. And I, I kind of say this laughingly, but if you have a St. Bernard and he wants to look like a greyhound, you can put the St. Bernard on the diet all you want, but he's only ever going to look like a skinny St. Bernard. He's never going to look like a greyhound. That's so but true. But he can be... He can be the best St. Bernard he could be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about vocal authenticity and talk about our voice brand, those elements remain true regardless of the brand, the voice brand. Um, it becomes about maximizing the great things, yeah. minimizing your detractors and being authentic to who you are. Um, and you have... In order to do that, you have to be vulnerable um, because you have to try things with your voice. Um, we've all had the experience when we know things vocally go really badly. <laughs> you come out of a meeting yeah. and you're like, oh my God, my voice just totally cracked. That did not go the way that I planned. Mm -hmm. My job then becomes to go, okay, why did that not work for you? What went well? What went wrong? How do we fix that for next time? You can't. And it's like performance anxiety for a singer. Once that happens, you there is a process to get back out on stage again because we know that performance anxiety exists. And so to work through that, you actually there's a process to work through it. And similarly, when a when a meeting goes badly, when a speech goes badly, when a conversation goes badly, we need to learn from the experience, not be panicked that it's going to happen again. Yes. My biggest takeaway from what you've said is about being true to yourself in all situations, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like being your authentic self. And that's something that I've worked really hard at for a number of years now and, and having that courage to turn up as the person that I truly am in any situation. And I know sometimes we'll go into a meeting, my husband and I have to go to see a bank manager or accountant mm -hmm. or a legal person. And he can't believe some of the things that I say. I say, yeah, but you know what? I'm being true to me. And this is how I, I feel that I need to say them. And I think that's something that we, as we mature and through life experiences isn't that something that we do start to find our authentic voice and our uniqueness by learning Absolutely. to speak up and be true to yourself every day and in every situation that you're in yeah so two things that i think about that as we as we as sort of thinking about wrapping our conversation up yes. too is um one your authentic self has changed over time mm -hmm. because you've had more life experiences, right? Yes. So that we, our voices change over time, reflective of that. Yes. So if you're trying to embody what you were at 20, vocally, I want to sound vocally youthful. That's not going to fly at 40, right? So mm -hmm. we have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that people most people inherently know this or we learn this, but some people don't know this. There are communication rules. So okay. you, you need to know when you should use language in this way, or what are the rules of communication in a social situation versus in a boardroom versus in the bedroom? Like those are all different communication um, rules Mm -hmm. um, that are fairly well established in the literature, <laughs> like it's not new. And we generally learn them from babies moving forward. Um, but if you don't know the rules of the game you're playing, it's very hard to win at the game, right? And yes. it's not about winning yes. or losing. No, but it but... is a game. It can be a game. There, and there right. are situations, so, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So we think about that. So it, it, it is a lot of multifactorial things going into how we use our voice to communicate yes. and uh, the factors that go into it. No, that, that was so interesting. But in wrapping up the TED Talk, can you do the sexy voice for us? That was really 
Uh, <laughs> um, right now, I'm just trying to think boys. of the word. I, I, I mean, I, I think you know, I think it was. I need you to get this done today, as I think what I said. Oh, really? um, so sexy voice was. Um, so you lower your pitch. Yeah. You get slightly so 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 the frequency is lower. Yes. The the talk is the the speed the rate is slower. Mm -hmm. Um, it is highly intonated uh, or have high inflection. Um, from a quality standpoint, it's not totally clear. It's slightly breathy, and the intensity, the loudness is usually soft. So it becomes. I need you to get this done today, right? So it's low pitch, slightly breathy, highly intonated, <laughs> right? Versus I need you to get this done today. That feels totally different, right? Same word, yes. same person. Wow, that was, I need <laughs> you to get this done today. Is that right? Yeah, cool. that's it. I'm getting close. Yeah. You're getting I, close. I think if I said that to my husband, he, I don't know, he'd probably run a mile. <laughs> he thinks an alien has stolen me and replaced me with somebody else. <laughs> okay. So, Wendy, what are you up to moving into the future? Oh, gosh. Um, so, private consulting, um, you know, with clients, corporations. Um, so that's the corporate side of what I do. I also am doing the vocal athlete side where I am working on getting all my artists and keeping them healthy and well on stage yes. um, for the longevity of their careers. Um, and then being a mom and being a wife, I am working on a, another book and some, um, some workshop series that people can work on their voice brand. So I'm working on all of those things, little bits at a time. Incredible. So feel free, feel free to reach out to me if this is something that interests yes. you. Yes, um, absolutely. You, know, you can find me. Well, we're going to share all this information in the show notes. Uh, you, I will receive all the links from you uh, that yes. people can go to if they wish to find you or learn more about your work or listen to your TED talk, because we need to get that up to a million views. So everybody needs to go and watch the TED talk and ask five of their friends to go and, and listen to it as well. So we need thank you, to get thank you, thank you. that up to a million views. So what happens when we get it to that? Because we're about 400,000 at the moment. I think somewhere around there. No, so um, my understanding is that to get to get to the big TED stage, you need at least a million views on okay. your on your TED. Let's talk, so. do it. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. please spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. So, just wrapping this up, the final couple of questions that I like short answers, like one word answers usually, but okay. not always. Okay, so who has been your greatest role model? My parents. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Can I ask why? What what was outstanding about your parents and their parenting? Oh my gosh. I think um just how they work together. Both they they as as parents and also running a business together. I think that takes a lot. The older I've gotten, the more I respect that. Yes. Um their belief in me to be my own person, even when I know I tested them <laughs> to the limits of what I did. Yeah. Um, and just constant, I think just constant love, like love is love is love is love. So yeah. Beautiful. And what is the book that you're reading right now? Um, I am finishing one of Brene Brown books. Um, I think the power of vulnerability is what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. I have several on my shelf. And then I just finished one of John Maxwell's books, actually. Great. Uh, that was an audio book. Yes. Okay. So we would recommend people go and listen to Brene Brown if they haven't discovered her work so far. It's, it is truly amazing. Well, I'm going to say thank you so much for today. Um, it's been an incredible experience interviewing you it's always a joy meeting with you we wish you all the very best and thank you so much for being a part of the podcast and yeah looking forward to great things from from wendy Laborn.
<laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I Absolute really appreciate pleasure. the opportunity to speak. And I can't wait to see you again in person yes. in Philadelphia or wherever yes. you may be. Yes, and, <laughs> and possibly not jet lagged. <laughs> possibly not jet lagged. It was actually at a TGA TGI Fridays or Ruby Tuesdays, right there on the corner is where yes, we met. Yes, I know. I, actually told, I do I know totally that. I remember sitting there. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, take care, Wendy. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much for Bye. having me. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.